Thank you. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath to you. Thank you for the introduction, Sister Elvira, and for the invitation, uh, Elder Carlo. I, I bring greetings from Ravensmead Church. I trust you had a good week. So, as you can see the, on the screen there, the sanctuary restored. We're going to study this morning from the Word of God. Nothing new, whatever I'll, I'm, I will share with you is what you've already heard. But I just want to put things into perspective. You know, if I may ask you, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? You might say because of the Sabbath. But we are not Seventh-day Adventists because of the Sabbath. If we study into our history, the Sabbath came later. But we are seven Adventists because of the scripture reading, this very scripture reading that I've shared with you, the cleansing of the sanctuary, or as the New American Standard Bible says, the sanctuary restored. And the context of the verse, or that particular one that you see on the screen, Daniel was uh, on the river Ulai, having this vision. And then he saw this ram with the two horns, one higher than the other. And while he was uh, looking at this one, another goat came with a single horn and uh, destroyed the ram. And then it says this goat with the one horn, his, his one was broken. And out of the broken one came four others. And then the Bible then begins with our scripture reading where it says, out of one of those four horns came this little horn power that did all these nasty things. And so this morning, I want to take you through a journey in the sanctuary. Now we can only understand what's happening in the heavenly one as we understand the earthly one. Because there was an earthly one. Remember the Moses went up the mountain and the, and the Lord gave him this plan, a sanctuary that needs to be built. And so this morning I want to take you through and let's understand the furniture that was, that occupied the building, the sanctuary then, and how it relates to Christ. And once we understand that, we will then see how this little horn power has defiled the temple by throwing down all these truths that we find within the sanctuary. And then eventually, how powerfully God then go, went about to restore every truth that has been thrown down or trampled upon and which will bring us to where we are today. So let's, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, now as we open your word, we cannot do so without you giving us deeper insight and understanding, Lord. Help me not to say things in my power, but in your mighty power, Lord. Hide me behind the cross, Lord. And as we study, may everything that we say this morning become clear is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to say to you, we're living in the antitypical day of atonement. I hope you understand what that means. Because as Adventists, we need to understand the sanctuary message. That is where we originate from as a people. Now, <clears throat> let me just see if I can get this right. Is the clicker not working? Can you just change to the next slide? Then? There we go. Here is a, a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy about the sanctuary. There's three that I would like to share with you. And then we will delve into the earthly sanctuary. It says here, the sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work in behalf of man. It concerns every living soul upon earth. 
It opens to view the plan of redemption, bringing us down to the very close of time and revealing the triumphant issue of the contest between righteousness and sin. That's the great controversy. And somewhere in between the great controversy between Satan and Christ, we are somewhere there in between. Sorry, this thing is, okay, there we go. Hmm. Then it continues to say, the intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. Now, for many denominations, you know, salvation ends and starts with the cross. But it's simply because the sanctuary is not understood clearly in its entirety. And therefore, as, we, as, as Jesus started the plan of redemption on the cross, it is taken further to the sanctuary above. By his death, he began that work which after his resurrection, he ascended to complete in heaven. Can you see there? We must by faith enter within the veil. Whether the forerunner for us enter, that is Christ. There the light from the cross of Calvary is reflected. There we may gain a clearer insight into the mysteries of redemption. And, and you know, of all the, the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist church, this one is the one that's most attacked. Not even the Sabbath. Because we share the Sabbath with some other denominations. But the sanctuary message is the one that is under the severest of attacks. And the devil knows because he knows when people start to understand what Christ is doing as our mediator, fear will vanish and they will have a deeper appreciation for the plan of redemption as it says here, the mysteries of, we will have a clearer insight into the mysteries of redemption and how privileged and honored we are as a people as a movement, as the remnant of God, to have such deep insights. The correct understanding of the ministration in the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. There we have it. We cannot go and bolt if we don't understand the sanctuary. Now, before we continue, there's a principle I would like you to understand. Present truth. Because we won't be able to understand the study to this morning unless we understand this principle. Uh, I, I, there's two definitions I would like to share with you. Present truth is truth that God reveals during a specific time period for a specific purpose. If that isn't clear, let's look at this one. Present truth is the principle that certain biblical truths are revealed to God's people at specific times in history. So that is what present truth is. And if I were to ask you, in our time, in the time that we are living, the end of time, what is present truth for us? It's the three angels' message. And with the three angels' messages comes... Fear God and give Him glory, for the hour of His judgment has come. There we find the sanctuary message. So we must proclaim this message of the, of the sanctuary. And to us as seven-day Adventists, and to the whole world, in fact, present truth is the three angels' messages. Now there was this need, God always had this need to be in the midst of His people. There you have it on the, on the screen. And let them, make me, let them make a sanctuary for me that I may dwell in their midst. According to all that I show you, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, even so you shall make it. That was a copy, a blueprint of the one that is in heaven that was given to, uh, to Moses. So, the purpose then of the sanctuary is, as the verse says, that I might dwell in the midst 
of them. God has this intense need to be amongst his people. And it was so throughout the centuries, even up to today. So we know that sin separates. Isn't that so? The Bible says in Isaiah 59, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor is ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you uh, from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear you. There's two things there. Sin and iniquities are two different things. But maybe that's a study for another time. So now God instructs, because sin separates, now he instructs the Israelites to build a sanctuary so that he can once again dwell in their midst and thus be reunited with his own people. And that is why the sanctuary was given. The sanctuary was given to demonstrate to us in a very tangible, detailed way how God goes about the process of reconciliation or bringing us at one mint to him, atonement. Can you see there? At one mint. It contained, so there's, you know, the, the, why was the sanctuary important? The, the articles of the furniture, everything, every utensil, every piece of furniture, was pointing to Christ. So that was the type. Christ being the anti-type. So the articles of furniture in the sanctuary basically pointed or testified about the Son of God, the coming Messiah. And then important, it kept the tables of stone, the Ten Commandments in the Ark of the Covenant. And so we see what you see here, somebody went through the trouble to make a full-scale model of what was given to Moses. And this is the actual, it's, not a, it's, it's a photo that you see there. So when you, and, and, and there's three compartments to the sanctuary, the outer court, the holy place, and then you will find the most holy place. And as you enter, and you know, whenever you had to enter, the entrance, you always entrance with your back to the east. You know, the sun was always behind you. And there's a reason for that, because Ezekiel, we find that the 25 elders, they were turning their backs on the sanctuary towards the sun. But be that as it may, you will see the altar of sacrifice, and then you will see the, um, the laver, and so we're going to ask ourselves, what does this, or how does this relate to Christ? Because everything was pointing to the coming Messiah that will give his life on the cross. So the altar of sacrifice, according to Leviticus and Colossians, it says, then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offerings, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. So here we see the sinner would come with a sacrifice, confesses his sin over that, given a knife, cut or kill the animal or the sacrifice. The blood is collected, taken to the altar, and the body will then be sacrificed on the altar of sacrifice. The Bible in the New Testament says, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him where the things of earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. So, as you enter, and you know, when you study or read the book Steps to Christ, the whole Steps to Christ is built on this very, very sanctuary. Coming, you coming to the cross. And then once you've accepted Christ, the next piece of furniture is the labor where baptism will take place. You see? So here we see the, the labor or the pointer to baptism. As you come to the cross for forgiveness, the next step in redemption is baptism. Romans 6.3 says, Or do you not know that as many of us 
were baptized into, Jesus, uh, into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. Romans 6 verse 4 says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even we also should walk in the newness of life. And, and so we, we move now from the outer court, which represented earth, where Christ had to come down, gave his life, so that we can be reconciled. So the question then is, what does baptism do? Bapt baptism, it baptizes us into Christ. Baptism, um, before baptism, there was a separation. So it reconciles us to Christ, right? So baptism was symbolized by this labor. And so thus, we can come to the conclusion that baptism brings reconciliation and is extremely important. It unites us with God and with Christ. Amen. Now we go into the, the first compartment of the actual sanctuary, you know. And here we see these uh, three items. We see the table of showbread. We see the altar of incense. And we see the, the seventh branch candlestick. So how does this relate to Christ? Now remember, I want to bring you quickly back to the topic that we are studying. Each of these furnitures that we've so far seen relates to Christ. It brings a teaching, a doctrine that we believe in. And somehow this little one power is going to trample upon these truths that we find in the sanctuary. And then God is going to restore all of these truths. And that is what, we, that, what the study is all about. So, if we continue, we say, we see that the, the table of showbread, the Bible says in John 6, 51, I am the living bread, which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled amongst them, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said, most assuredly, assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So the table of bread is the living word of God, right? For my flesh is food indeed. And my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Again, reconciliation. Can you see? So when we eat the word of God, there is reconciliation because we are in Christ and he in us. The next item is the altar of incense. Sweet smelling smoke from incense represented the people's prayer ascending to God. It represented the work of the high priest interceding for us. Jesus is our mediator, our intercessor. And according <clears throat> Exodus 30, 10 says, And Aaron shall make atonement upon his horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. Once a year he shall make atonement upon it through your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. Thus the high priest on the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, the altar of incense, represented the process of reconciling, of reconciliation, when the high priest was interceding for God's people. Then we come to the seven bronze candlestick. Jesus, the light of the world. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Where they, when, when, when the word is taken away from people, when the Bible is taken away, they live in total, total darkness. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. So now we're going to move into the most holy place. And here we find the law. It says here, now he who keeps his commandments 
abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So the ark contained the tables of stone, the bowl of manna, and then the stick that budded, right? So in summary then, as we've taken this quick journey through the, the sanctuary, this is what we need to remember. The altar of sacrifice represents the death of Christ on the cross of Calvary. The laver, his burial. The candlestick, Christ, the light of the world. The showbread, Christ, the bread of life. The altar of incense, Christ, our intercessor or mediator. And then the ark of the covenant, Christ, as the law of God personified. So that was the introduction, and I see we're almost at 12 o'clock. <laughs> so now comes the very interesting part, church. How did God, how was these defiled? How was these truths trampled upon? Um, Leviticus says, that we all know about the day of atonement. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgression for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of the uncleanliness. So therefore there was a cleansing, a restoration. So the entire sanctuary pointed to the atonement, the day of atonement, or the unification between God and man. It pointed to the work God would do for man in Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19 says, that is that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, as has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So, if we look at the earthly sanctuary, the sanctuary on the outside was a, was a very plain building, but on the inside was the very presence of God. It was founded in the midst of the 12 tribes, in the very same way, when Jesus came to the earth, he looked like a very ordinary man, but inside him was the very presence of God. Just as the sanctuary was surrounded by the 12 tribes of Israel, so Jesus came in the midst of the 12 tribes and dwelt amongst the 12 disciples. In the Old Testament, God was in the sanctuary, reconciling the people to him. In the New Testament, God is in Christ, reconciling the world to him. So let's look at how this, uh, how the sanctuary was defiled, or the truth that it represented was trampled upon. And here we, we have our scripture reading. And I'll start there with verse 11. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of the sanctuary was cast down because of transgression. An army was given over to the horn to oppose the day, daily sacrifices. And, the, and he cast through down to the ground. He did, he did all this and prospered. Now, when we, we need to understand, church, that the sanctuary here could not have been the one in Jerusalem in the time of the disciples, because that one was destroyed. So there only remains a heavenly sanctuary. This is a very important point that you need to understand. So this prophecy can only, be, can only point to the heavenly one. The little one power was thus attacking the heavenly sanctuary and the truth that it contains, like we just saw. And all of these truths were pointing to Christ, right? So how was, how were these truths cast down? So number one, this little one power, the sacrifice of Christ was cast down and it was replaced by what they call penance. So the death of Christ was done once and for all on the cross. But during the reign of the little one power, a teaching arose that the sacrifice of Christ was not enough. In order to be forgiven of your sins, 
You had to pay money to the church and you had to do penance or you had to do atonement or amends. And we know not no work of our own can ever save us because we are saved by grace. The Bible reminds us our best works are like filthy rags in the sight of God. So this was a direct attack on the heavenly sanctuary because it changed the way people view God. Secondly, what about infant baptism? Infant baptism was introduced and uh, true baptism was replaced by infant sprinkling. Can you see how the truth of the sanctuary was cast down? This meant that you don't have to ask forgiveness because you were baptized as a child. The teaching was that God would burn your baby forever in hell. And that is when the church, the Roman Catholic Church, introduced baptism by sprinkling, infant baptism. And again, the teaching put a bad spot on the character of God. What about the showbread, the bread of life, the word of God? And we know during the dark ages, you know, the, the scriptures were chained to the to whatever they, and it, it was only the priest that could read it. So during the dark ages, the scriptures were practically cast aside, being supplanted by the decrees of popes and councils, so that its teaching had no influence upon the masses of the people who did not have copies in their possession. And you know, we, t we take it for granted, the very Bible that we have in our hands, but we don't know how, how many people had to die so that we can have the word of God in our hands today. Nor could they have read them if they had them, doubtless made unnecessary the serious alteration of the text at a time when bold, bad men had abundant power to do so. And let me say, the, 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 the word of God is again under attack. There's a group of people um, that would like to change the, the Bible to suit their purposes. You know, the LGBTQ um, gender, whatever, so that all of those things will be taken out of the word of God. It, it happened then, and it's happening again. What about the altar of incense, which pointed to the mediation of Christ? It was defiled when this little one power uh, started to teach that in order for you to speak to Christ, you had to pray through Mother Mary. You see? Confession of sins was done in a confessional to a human priest and not God, and thus creating breaches, separating man from God. And then the seven branch candlestick. That's when, we, when you separate God from man, when you take away the word of God from man, you are causing man to walk in darkness. And those who walk in darkness are separated from God. Because God is the light of the world. And then, the little one power, Daniel 7.25, tried to change the law of God. The Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, was now replaced with the first day of the week, Sunday, as the week, as the day of worship. But, the Bible says in this verse, And he said to me, For unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And the, in other words, how long will this little one power continue to desecrate the sanctuary? And the answer came back, 2,300 days. Or as our scripture reading said, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful place. For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful place. So now, is it then, any wonder, no, or any coincidence, no, there's no um, coincidences with God. It's a calculated, God waited when the time was right. He would call men and women to restore these truths. So I'm sorry, I'm rushing. So let's, let's go to the first one. Now remember before I start, I want you to remember the principle of present truth. Isn't that so? You all understand the principle of present truth. So, look at this. God called these men to restore the truths that the little one power has dest destroyed in the sanctuary. The first one that he restored was the word of God, the table of showbread. 
John Wycliffe, he translated the Bible to the language of the people, namely English. In so doing, he restored the truth about the table of showbread. If we would have lived in his time, we would have had a copy of the word of God in English, in our own language, so that we would be able to understand the word of God for ourselves. Darkness would disappear. Isn't that so? So he repaired the breach, and he was persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church while in England because he told the people the truth about, of what the Bible said about God, about Jesus, and about the Holy Spirit. Then as we move on to the 1400s, Martin Luther restored the altar of sacrifice. He was the founder of the Lutheran Church. Now, if we had to live in the 1400s, we would have been Lutherans. Yes, because this was present truth in his time. You understand? So he restored the truth that it is not through indulgences or penance, but by the sacrifices of Christ that men are forgiven by their sins. No, nothing else. So Lutheran taught that salvation and consequently eternal life are not earned by good, do good deeds, but are received only as the free gift of God's grace through the believer's faith in Jesus Christ as the redeemer of sin. Amen. So in the 1400s, we would have been Lutherans. In the 1500s, the altar of incense, John Calvin, founder of the Presbyterian Church, if we had to live during that time, the present truth was that the altar was of incense was restored. He said that we do not need to pray through priests and po popes. We, we don't need to pray through Mary. You understand? We can directly approach Christ. And therefore, we would have been Presbyterian. In the 1600s, the labor baptism, Roger Williams, maybe not so well known, but you need to search for these things on the internet. Everything that I share with you, I gotten from Wikipedia, by the way. <laughs> Founder of the Baptist Church. In the 1600, Brother Crouch, we would have been Baptist. Because that was the present truth being preached at that time. He effectively restored the labor. They began to teach that you cannot be sprinkled as a baby. You must repent. Then be baptized. You mustn't have an understanding of the word of God. You need to be old enough to understand that you're a sinner in need of repentance. Thus, effectively, effectively restored the labor. And then John Wesley, founder of the Methodist Church, in this time, in the 1700s. Now you can see where we're going with this, eh? Yeah? In the 1700s, we would have been Methodist. He restored the seven bronze candlestick. He, did, he was an evangelist, preaching the word of God, bringing the light to the people. And therefore, in the 1700, this truth has been restored. So, what in church was the last one that had to be restored? Can you see? The law of God. God called these men and women. This is where, the, this is where our history starts. As a church. The remnant of God. William Milner. Hiram Edson. James White. Uriah Smith. Alan Harmon. Remember they misunderstood this prophecy. But that was the beginning and God called these men and women. And therefore, this was present truth. And it is still present truth today. And therefore, we must be Adventists. Yes. 
There's no, all the truth has now been restored, church. And, there we, and therefore, we are at the right place, at the right time, at the end of time, in the history of time. We are Seventh-day Adventists. Amen. Because God called this church because of the, the misinterpretation of that prophecy. It concludes in the year 1844. The very time when this end time movement came upon the scene. And it restores especially the Sabbath commandment. Fear God and give Him glory. Can you see? So that is why we are Seventh-day Adventists. And, and, and somehow, you know, it, it gives me a sense of direction. I now understand that God has called us as a remnant to this time to go out and preach the three angels' messages because the, the truth has now been restored. But wait, there's more, friends. The final movement, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, brings together all the teachings of all the other movements into one. Yes, we believe in every other truth that has been restored. And, and, and it's no coincidence that the, these men and women came from the, the Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterian. And eventually they called, they were called to form this, the Remnant Movement. It is the only movement it is the only movement that was formulated by the coming together of people of various denominations. Thus we see a unification of different people coming together, which is the very purpose of the sanctuary, namely to unite. That is what the sanctuary does, nothing else. You see? And that is why God's end time movement is specifically called the repairers of the bridge. Look at this verse. You've seen it before. What I'm sharing with you is nothing new. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called repairer of the bridge, the restorer of streets to dwell in. That is what we are. I'm going to skip this verse for the sake of time, but you know Isaiah 58, the Sabbath one, and et cetera, et cetera. But here is a, is a verse that I would like to share with you, the ministry of reconciliation. What is the purpose of the sanctuary? It's to unite. And listen to this. God says in 2 Corinthians 5, 18, now all, the, all, things, are God, now all things are of God, <clears throat> who has reconciled us to himself, through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Can you see? And therefore, we've got this responsibility. We've got this responsibility that we need to tell the world about the sanctuary message. That the plan of redemption didn't start and end at the cross. There's a second phase where God will investigate his people, and clean up the sanctuary. Look at verse 2 Corinthians 5.20. Now then, we are ambassadors to Christ. You know what an ambassador is? You're a representative of heaven, and you were called to have this awesome responsibility to tell people about the three angels' messages. That is our, our job. But friends, it doesn't just end there. We've, we, the teacher here, the Sabbath school teacher, told us about the, the war. That was the study uh, for the Sabbath school. So the truth of the heavenly sanctuary has been restored. Amen. So how is Satan going to attack this message now that the truth has been restored? He can't do it the same way he did during the Dark Ages. He's going to do this differently. And the Bible tells us how he's going to do this. You know what? He's going to do it through this verse. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God 
and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Ah, uh, friends, you don't you don't get it, huh? I mean, how many how many denominations can claim this this verse? They can't. We are officially at war. When you've joined this church there, whether you like it or not, he's coming for you. You know, Pastor, Pastor Howard said the other day that this church, the remnant church, is the thorn in the flesh of the devil. Yeah. Because of this. So now, and you've never thought that you are at war, eh? And the bit battle is fierce. It's not a physical one. It's all up here. Some of us struggle. We are tempted. We struggle with sin. But we need to keep our eyes focused and put on the full armor. Isn't that so? So, so, so Satan went to make war with us, the remnant. He went to make war against the sanctuary. The sanctuary? But the sanctuary has been restored. You know? He can't attack the sanctuary in heaven as he did in the dark ages because of all the truths that has been restored. So the question is, how is he going to make war? Right? And there's that verse. Do you not know that you are the? You see? Can you see? It's, it's no coincidence. Out of this verse, the health message was born. <laughs> yeah. Do you not know that you are the temple of God? This body, this temple of God, is attacking us, you know? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which are you. I didn't say it. The Bible says, we are the temple of God. So the devil is after us, man. Full force. He's out to destroy us completely, spiritually. The verses above have a deeper meaning. Meaning, in Satan's end time attack against the sanctuary message, it's, attack, it's an attack against the sanctuary, the people of God. So thus, the place that holds the law, sorry, it's a bit small there. The place that holds the law, can you see, is the human being. And the human being is the sanctuary. I now understand why Pastor Howard said that the remnant church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, yes, man, let's say it. The Seventh-day Adventist church is the thorn in the flesh of, this, of the devil. Yes, there is still a sanctuary in heaven, but God has a movement that came upon the scene through successive movements which restored all the truths of the sanctuary. Thus, Satan is going after the earthly sanctuaries, the temples, in order to get them to reject the principles of the articles of the furniture. Of furniture. Thus, Satan knows that if you are not living up to the principles of the articles of furniture, you are apostatizing against the sanctuary message. And therefore, friends, you know, I want to show you this. Can you see the temple? He wants to get our minds. Doesn't the Bible say our fight is not against flesh and blood? Against principalities of darkness. Isn't that so? And everything we do, sin doesn't originate within your toes or within your hands. It, it starts here with a temple. Can you see? So may God bless you. And I hope you've got a, a better understanding of Daniel 8, verse 14. And how everything comes together. And that you now have purpose and meaning that you can live your life according because you were called as a witness. Because look, friends, we still have a further duty. We will stand on the sea of glass as witnesses because we need to vindicate the name of Christ. The accusations that was made in heaven against Christ, we will be there. 
And we must make sure that we are there so that the name of Christ, the name of God can be vindicated. May God bless you.